Welcome to the South Brevard Historical Society. Uh, thank you all for uh, working with us on locations. The library is redoing the room. It looks real nice, but it's not done, although it's supposed to be done this time. But anyway, hey, thanks for all for being here. Uh, before I introduce uh, the radiators and, and Diane, uh, Nancy Dillon wants to come up and update us. Oh, she's right there. Thanks. Thank you, Don. I just have a quick announcement. I'll be giving a, an hour-long walking tour of the O'Galley Arts District murals. It's the outdoor museum program that we started in 2009. And um, so this will take place on November the 3rd, starting at 9 o'clock. And we'll meet in the lobby area of the O'Galley Library. And you're welcome to come. It's free. And I'll be the one giving the tour. Okay? Go to see you then. Thank you. Okay, um, today we have a real special program. Uh, one of our former members he passed on was Frank Perkins, and his dream was always to tell the story of, of radiation systems and the people, the radiators. And so today we're really um, lucky to have these folks come explain the company and the people to us. So we have Diane Newman from FIT, Special Collections Curator, and then we have A.B. Amos, Jack Johnson, and Claire Davis, who will each tell us some stories they could go on for a long time, so I'm going to let you guys know, like 15, 20 minutes in, and then you can pass it to the next, and then we have time for uh, questions afterwards. And we have the room to at least 4.30. It sounds like we're going to be pushing it today, but we'll get all the information in. So uh, please welcome Diane to, to introduce everybody. been in the audience many times, and most of those times Frank Parkins was in the audience as well. But I never thought, what would I possibly be doing coming up to do a presentation? I'm really a newcomer to Melbourne. I've only been here 10 years. That's practically uh, just arrived. So uh, when Don Jennings told me that uh, he would like for us to present information about uh, the radiation archives, at uh, Florida Tech, I thought this is fabulous and that's what I'm doing here. The microphone's not working. Oh, it's so not. No. Can you hear me without it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm using okay. electrical engineers. I don't okay. know. Okay. Right I'll just, if you can't hear me, let me know. Okay, so um, Frank Perkins, as I would imagine, how many people here knew Frank? Okay. So you know that Frank had something on his mind. Yes, <laughs> he was very persistent. And uh, the first time that he came to the university, he went through the uh, president of our university, so we had to talk to him. And he came with the idea of uh, the, all of the things that had been collected from this little company that started in Melbourne. And, and A.B. and Jack are going to tell you all about that company. Uh, and we just, we didn't know. What, what does it have to do with us? Well, you're going to find out that the, the uh, company Radiation Inc. Uh, was intertwined with the city of Melbourne and beyond. Uh, and you will find out that it's also uh, its founders sat on the board of trustees of our university. There's buildings named after them. So there was a lot of connections. So Frank kept after us and after us and after us. And finally, we agreed to take his papers. And it has been such an amazing experience for me as a curator. The papers themselves, but also all of the wonderful people that I've met. And so you're going to get a little taste of what I am fortunate enough to experience. Uh, I will start with A.B. Amos, who was uh, with uh, radiation. Tell me if this is right, 14 out of the 17 years that it was radiation aid, is that right? <laughs> Total of 33 years. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, are y'all going to be able to hear me or am I going to need to mess with that? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, in 1949, a company up in Virginia sent two of their engineering managers, Homer Denius and George Shaw, down to the Cape to witness what turned out to be the first successful launch of the German V-2 rocket down to the test range. And uh, George and Homer were very impressed with that. They went back and they recommended to their management 
that they establish a branch of the co company down here in Florida. The manager said, Florida is nothing but alligators and mosquitoes. Forget about it. Uh, so uh, they didn't want to forget about it. Uh, they thought that it was good business potential. So Homer sold his home for $20,000. George sold his for five. They put that money together. They came to Melbourne and uh, they incorporated in early, uh, in late 1950, I believe. They uh, rented a building from the city, the old administration building out at the airport. It sat just north of the Trailer Haven Rec Hall that is still there. Uh, the building that they were in uh, leaked and uh, it's not there now. Uh, there's, a, I think, a shuffleboard court or something there. But uh, they, uh, so they, they hired a few people, started getting a few contracts, and uh, they weren't, they were both, had, their background was in telemetering. I don't know if everybody knows what telemetering is. Uh, when you've got a test aircraft or a missile or something, you would like to know uh, how it's doing. You'd like to know what the uh, vibration is and the pressure in the fuel tank and all this kind of stuff. So you put instruments on there to measure that and then you radio that to the ground as telemetering. And so that was what their background was and they, they had believed that there would be good telemetering business coming out of the cave. And uh, they were right, but it didn't happen right away. For the first few years, they just took contracts, whatever they could get. One of their early contracts was installing an interim timing system down the test range. Another contract they got was with uh, just supply some people to Glen L. Martin Company, who was building the Matador missile, and that was one of the early users of the test range. And so we helped them uh, design a mechanical guidance system for that. When I joined the company, let's flip to the next slide now. When I joined the company in early 1953, uh, that was pretty much the whole company. There were probably about 70 employees, and I could name just about every one of these guys now, and that's the one building that we're in. Uh, so as of 1953, about 70 people in one building. Our carpenter and electrician were renovating another building that would just about be in the parking lot across from the terminal building at the airport now. Uh, People who had come before I did had settled in Loveridge Heights, uh, and uh, I, Melbourne, had uh, just opened up Magnolia Manor. That was a hot new place, and so most of the people that came about the time I did uh, moved into Magnolia Manor, and uh, there wasn't much to do in Melbourne at that time. Population was less than 5,000, probably 3,500 or so. If you wanted to do anything other than shop for the basics, you were looking at a trip to Orlando. And that wasn't easy, because uh, St. John's River was across 192 a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the formula that Homer and George had in mind for the company was they were going to hire outstanding people. And uh, the question was, how are you going to get outstanding people to come down to this little podunk place and how are you going to get them to stay? Uh, nothing to do, uh, no, no colleges, no nothing. Uh, in fact, the bank wouldn't even loan money against government contracts. There was one little bank, Bank of Melbourne and Trust Company. And so and they wouldn't loan money. So we had to do business with a bank in Orlando. And uh, Homer fixed that later. He started his own bank. Uh, First National Bank in Melbourne. Uh, so, what what do you do to make the community attractive to employees? Well, George Shaw got busy. He worked with Jimmy Holmes uh, to uh, raise money and, and promote interest in, the, in establishing the new Holmes Regional Hospital. Both of my kids were born at this little place just north of Colonial Motel on US-1. <laughs> so maybe a lot of them. Uh, and and uh, so they, the ladies, the wives, uh, 
they formed a Radiation Lions Club. Dory will know all about that. Uh, um, to help get the wives up to do. And the wives uh, did fundraisers and they participated in things. They probably helped to raise money for the hospital. They probably became big ladies at the hospital. They did fashion shows and things. Uh, so uh, George and Homer were both boaters. So uh, that was one of the things that probably had attracted them to Melbourne. So uh, George became uh, organized, I guess, the Melbourne Yacht Club and became the first, maybe an early Commodore there. Homer became a Commodore of O'Galley Yacht Club later. And uh, so, uh, let's see. Then there was this guy named Jerry Cooper who uh, worked out at uh, RCA and he decided he, that we needed an engineering college here. And so uh, he started uh, Brevard Engineering College. George Shaw was the first chairman of the board of uh, Brevard Engineering College. And George continued on the board almost up until the time of his death in 2010. Attended nearly all the meetings, and as he said, I didn't always vote yes. Um, <laughs> he, uh, George was a, a visionary character uh, and a man of strong conviction. And, uh, he, was, he was a good guy. Uh, so, uh, Brevard Engineering College at first, I think, was meeting in the old Creole Elementary School mm -hmm. up on uh, whatever the street is, the Pineapple, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but then they got kicked out of there. Uh, maybe the school board decided that wasn't appropriate. And so I guess Homer uh, Dennis uh, had some spare room uh, in a building owned by the First National Bank. So uh, they moved into there for a while. Uh, I guess uh, radiation would come up with some money every time uh, Brevard Engineering College would get in a pinch. And so it was a good good relationship. And uh, so, and radiation staff would teach classes there. Uh, lots, lots of, lots of people. Uh, George and Nancy Gleason worked together to unify Melbourne and O'Galley in trying to create a population base large enough to interest shopping malls to come in so we didn't have to make the trip to Orlando. Uh, finally, in probably about 1954, we got a contract from Wright Field in Ohio to build a telemetering system it was going to be used to uh, instrument some drone, drone jet aircraft that were going to be flown through the uh, atomic bomb test in, in Nevada, uh, named Operation Teapot. And so we were going to put telemetering equipment on the, on the aircraft and we were building, uh, receiving stuff on the ground. But the Drones could not land at the Melbourne Airport. It was only 10,000 feet long at that time. It needed to be 12, I think. Radiation offered to extend the runway by 2,000 feet in exchange for free rent on some more buildings out of the airport. There was a lady named Mrs. Archie Kerr on the board at that time. And it seemed like anything radiation wanted, she did not want. Uh, she, she was a problem. Uh, but we couldn't tell them why we needed to extend the runway. Uh, atomic business is all big secrets. Uh, and so uh, we ended up uh, establishing a new division in Orlando. That uh, really could use the airport by Pine Castle. Uh, radiation actually considered leaving. Melbourne. Melbourne was not very welcoming at that time. Uh, Orlando wanted us, Fort Lauderdale wanted us. Uh, the bank that we had been doing business with in Orlando moved down to Fort Lauderdale. He invited Homer down uh, to look over the place. George Hall says Homer went down, drove down there in a little Porsche automobile he had, said it rained and the ignition got wet and you couldn't car start the car. I said, that's why we didn't move to Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> the, the boating would have been better. Uh, 
Okay, so anyhow, we, we started that division. We did we did well on that contract. The uh, equipment performed well on the atomic bomb test. And so Wright Field gave us another contract, this time for the uh, first pulse code modulation telemetry system. And uh, this contract had actually been started by this company up in Virginia that George and Homer had come from. That company uh, was in, on the inside track. It was there and located in the, uh, inside the Beltway in uh, Washington area. They could get contracts, but then they didn't follow through on them very well. And they couldn't keep people. They could have tried good people, but they couldn't keep uh, because they didn't follow through. Anyhow, uh, they had started a contract for this false code modulation telemetry system. And they sort of fumbled it. So our right field gave us a contract to pick up the pieces. And uh, George could see at that time the tremendous potential of false code modulation, the beginning of digital communications, uh, the beginning of everything that we've got now from, from uh, hand computers and cell phones, everything you can think of. Uh, and George could see that, the potential of that. We built that and uh, we hired some consultants that were well known. Uh, our technical people just started a blitz of writing technical papers and flooded the marketplace. We were attending uh, conferences and brag about this PCM telemetry. And uh, people started writing it into the specifications. And so we undertook to capture the market, corner the market. We underbid everybody uh, on that. We ended up with a lot of overruns, but uh, <laughs> and, and late, late in overruns, but uh, but we cornered the market on it, and it was a good thing that we did. Uh, this was during the Cold War now, and uh, things were pretty exciting here uh, along the Space Coast. Uh, it, five minutes to go. Uh, okay, all right, I'm, yeah, I'm about right. Okay, uh, <laughs> so uh, you'd see your neighbor go outside and stand in the street so I'd look at north. You knew to go outside and stand like there's going to be a missile launch or something. He couldn't tell you. But, uh, it's, uh, and, uh, but every, everybody was committed because we were in the Cold War and we were losing. So the Russians had launched that damn Sputnik and, uh, you know, and so we were committed and people worked hard. We would go on, on the weekends, uh, we'd go to the beach, you could go to the beach and build a bonfire anywhere you wanted, back in the woods, you could drink beer, do all kinds of stuff. We could go water skiing, the water was clear enough, you could see the bottom. Uh, and we water skied on the north side of the Melbourne Causeway over toward Eastminster Church every Sunday. It was a good time. Uh, so, um, in Probably in 1959, we received a contract from Boeing for a telemetry for the Minuteman missile. The, the PCM systems that we had been providing up to that point had been used for testing components of missiles. They were used on the Holloman sled track to test the uh, solid rocket boosters, and they were used for AC spark plug a contract to develop a guidance system for the Atlas missile. We were providing things like that, but nothing that was going to actually go on a missile and really uh, have to shake and rattle and do all this stuff. So the, that contract was about 10 times larger than any contract we'd ever had before. And so, and Boeing was serious about uh, meeting specifications. Nobody before had really held their feet to the fire. They were just glad to get their system, but Boeing, they were serious about it. And, uh, so we learned a lot from that. And we developed uh, uh, some equipment that later became the basis for other contracts uh, and, uh, and a reputation. We got a good reputation from that. And so we became the go-to place for PCM telemetry really. And uh, uh, so that Minuteman uh, required that we expand some Palm Bay offered us some land down there and help with getting financing for it. And so we moved, made a move down to Bombay. And so let's go from here to the next picture maybe is uh, 
Homer and George standing proudly out in front of their new building, which is down in Bombay. There we go. Uh, George Shaw, Homer Dingus. Uh, okay, uh, the one mistake that they made was they believed, uh, probably along with other people, that a company, an electronic company, was going to need to have an in house. Uh, semiconductor cap capability. Uh, we began to use integrated circuits and things like that. And so we invested heavily in starting up a semiconductor division, which never really paid off very well. It was a it was a big money sink. Money went in, not much money was coming out. And so we were being courted by that time by a bunch of companies. Texas Instrument wanted to merge with us. Uh, IBM wanted us, maybe Bowen wanted us, uh, but the Justice Department wouldn't agree to any of those. They looked like a monopoly or something. Finally, a company came along called Harris Enterprise, and the uh, Justice Department did not have a problem with that. And I guess radiation, particularly Homer, could see the need for more access to financing than radiation was able to get independently. and so. The merger took place between Radiation and Paris. Uh, some people called it an acquisition. People at Radiation called it a merger. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it wasn't popular with the engineering people. Uh, it was entirely different mentality. Paris uh, was focused on quarterly profits. Radiation had been focused on pie in the sky and growth and things like that, technical things. But uh, Harris was focused on quarterly profits. And uh, I am told that we had a meeting shortly after that. There was some unrest. Uh, and at a meeting, I asked Homer, I said, Homer, why did you sell us out? And he said, A.B., I didn't sell you out. He says, if the people in this room are not running, the company in 10 years, I'll be damn disappointed. And he was right. Uh, within 10 years, Dr. Joe Boyd uh, from Radiation was CEO of Harris Corporation. Uh, following him, Jack Harvey. Uh, and so he Homer was right. And I, but I was so bent out of shape that I quit my job. <laughs> and I went off and tried to get rich and famous renting motorhomes to tourists coming up. <laughs> but the Arab oil embargo made that a bad idea. It was already a bad idea. <laughs> so I had to put my tail between my legs and, and come back with my hand to my hand. So I came back to a different division. Uh, okay. Uh, 25 years later, a bunch of, uh, three of us, I guess, were having a lunch at the sea room. And we said, hey, you remember that great party that Dan Hammer had where he invited everybody to get radiation? And nearly everybody came. Hey, did you work there? I didn't see you before. Uh, and nearly everybody came. And uh, wouldn't it be fun to get that old gang together again and uh, rub elbows and talk about all the guys? And so we set out, and I agreed to host uh, a reunion and others. We got busy. And we came up with a list of people that worked at the airport. And almost 200 people came on a fine October day in 1996. And we had a good time, a lot of fear, a lot of, a lot of camaraderie. And uh, had another reunion three or four years later. And then maybe a couple of years later, another one. And then we hosted another one. And then somebody said, this make these annual things. And so we did. And then we had an annual Oh, let's go to the radiation old timer thing. Uh, there we are. Uh, radiation old timer reunions. Uh, so we had these every year from about 2003. I just wanted to introduce Clara and myself, and I also have someone else I want to introduce in the back is Ganesh and Clara. Ganesh has been working with radiation as well. He's one of our graduate students. Uh, came here because he wanted to hear more. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Clara has been volunteering with me for a year and a half, two years? Going on two years. Okay, and she's going to tell you the story. The story goes with this. Well, 
I'm Claire Davis, and I'm sure some of you that worked in the early days of radiation are wondering who am I. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still trying to find that out. So, uh, I came to Harris in 1972, so it was pretty much a perfect uh, uh, lead-in to what A.B. just said in terms of I came as what they used to call a junior project planner. And right off a of college campus out of Tallahassee, Florida a and University. I was there for 40 years. But, um, and, and again, keeping with what A.B. said, I was what they call, you know, you got, your engineers call us bean counters. And as you just said, we were more concerned about the profit. And when you're working with engineers, they, there's the pie in the sky, you know, they just love to continue to work. And so, uh, that was great. I like that. So as a bean counter, uh, all those years I have worked very, very closely with projects and programs. In fact, I met Jack here in 1981 on the B1 program. But the first program I worked on when I came to have, uh, it was Radiation, a subsidiary of Harris Intertype at the time. And the very first program I worked on was BASS versatile tool avionics shop tester. So I will always remember my work on the VAST program. So when um, I did not know Frank, um, I know people spoke very fondly of Frank. I finally got to see Frank in 2017. As A.B. said, it was the very <coughs> last get together and we had it at the Elks Club. And he came and everyone just surrounded him. He was like a celebrity when he walked into the Elks Club that day. Um, and at that time, Diane was looking for uh, volunteers and I retired in 2012. So I've been retired now for six years. And I have pretty much become a consummate volunteer. Um, and so I did volunteer, I guess around June, the earliest I can tell. And when I walked into um, the library, I had seen this in the paper. All of you saw this. In fact, this was probably one of the last pictures of Frank that was featured in the Florida Today with Diane. And if you notice, these containers, these binders, house Frank Perkins' life. Um, so when I walked in to uh, Diane and she showed me the Frank Perkins side, um, it was some of everything. I mean, he was, it was Frank himself, of course. Uh, there were his TAs where he had traveled all over the world. Um, his I think his check stubs, it was everything. <laughs> In fact, we had to start uh, scr uh, scratching out his social security number because back then everything had your social security number on it. His TAs, he had company events, he had working papers, he had kept brochures from companies that no longer exist anymore. Uh, but they were key at the time that he was doing all of this work. He had technical briefings, memos, letters, documents, patent information. It was just, so when I came, it's like, oh my God, Diane, I love you and I really want to volunteer, but what are we going to do here? So as an eager volunteer, I really saw a bunch of junk. <laughs> But as Diane kept saying, it's valuable junk. So <laughs> it was uh, it was confusing, and at that time I had no idea what our end goal would be. That's like a year and a half ago. Where are we going with this? Uh, it was like the old adage: How do you eat an elephant? How do you tackle a project like this? Because to put it in perspective, you saw those. Uh, gray bins and it was like about eight of them on a shelf and about five shelves so you, you know you're talking about 40 to 50 bins of information there was some duplication and on top of that diane is like okay we got to take the staples out and some of the staples just came apart 
and some of it it took time to peel away because that's just how old the material was that he had so it's like we got to take this one bite at a time we got to do this uh, uh, and we got to think of a process so again having as a bean counter having done proposals working with program office throughout my whole career I knew that we had to look at this differently. We either had to make this what software engineers call an iterative process or a recursive approach where we could just break this down into pieces and then we go back and we look at it again. And this is what we did for about a year. <laughs> is that a hard drill? <laughs> Oh, okay, we're just on the phone. I'm like, okay, there's a fire drill. <laughs> so, um, and then another thing I found out that Diane had some of her students that had already taken uh, Frank information and they had tried to time, come up with a, a timeline of, in, in, in the order because I think Frank had started like in the early 50s uh, and she was calling it epoch epic versus epic. There's a slight difference in the way they're pronounced. Uh, but anyway, she kept saying, and I had never heard of the E-P-O-U-C-H uh, method. And I guess Frank came in one day. <laughs> but then I since learned that that was, um, they were trying to tie everything in, in order of, of how events took place. Uh, but then, Frank came in, I guess, one day, and that's, this was before, maybe it was right in his last few days, and said, a uh, Jack, and said, I met Epic. Um, in, in terms of uh, events in the life of radiation. Another, uh, the group, the library had come up with what they call finding aids, and we had a timeline <coughs> that kind of separate. So our next uh, task was, okay, let's break this down into documents, personal, so you can see this uh, work, this work breakdown structure organization is what we were working on at that time. And under history, again, Frank had administrative items, he had history, he had all of the old timers, remembrance, reunions, directories, people names, telephone numbers, uh, just everything. Social events, as A.B. just talked about, they worked hard, but they also played hard too. So that was evident, and we had so, uh, little league, uh, volleyball teams, softball teams, but under the technical, this is where the bulk of Frank's information was, was under the technical. Again, under the publications, he had a lot of advertisement, brochures, and pamphlets, and books, and newsletters. Again, it was a lot of stuff. He had photographs, the early days of what Palm Bay looked like, uh, physical objects, and recordings. So as I work with Diane, and as I started familiarizing myself with it, and I promised her I would continue on, but I couldn't continue that way. It's like, okay, we got to look at this another way. And it became obvious after about a year, oh, we need to take Frank's technical and let's break it down into products. Again, all of this was before my time, and as AB was just telling you, that uh, radiation was very heavy into the PCM telemetry. So we found, what we found that appeared to be duplications were different projects or products with similar kind of information, similar memos, similar uh, schematics. I mean, he kept every schematic. And <laughs> we had to learn how to separate what was either Radicon, Radiplex, telemetry, data handling products, and multiplexers. So, then we started our recursive process. We had our, our first passes 
we collected the data she had already collected and had done a chronology order of this information. Then we revisited the structure, revisit, revisit, reorganize, revisit, reorganize. Each week, Diane had me going back through the boxes again. Um, then we were, then task three is now we need to verify. Then we went through and we verified and re reorganized, revalidated. Um, so at that time, I, I can tell you now where are we? We are at the point now where we believe we have reorganized enough that we can move forward. And we have a revisit to the finding aids, we've resorted. So we believe we're over in the task three uh, portion of this uh, effort. And one day about three months ago, a light bulb went off. And it's like, still, where are we going with this? What are we going to do with Frank Perkins? Because we cannot toss this. This is definitely history. So as we're driving along, I realize, you know, this is Frank Perkins' legacy. This is him. He talks about people. He talks about products. He talks about how you went through the marketing process. How many of you in here were along with Frank? I see some faces, I know your names are etched in all of his uh, papers, his memos, uh, and it's about customers, and interesting things about customers. And this is the era that we're talking about. We have this, this was a picture that was taken at the 30, 35 years. So mainly Frank was the 50s and 60s. And these were pioneers of electronics for the space, and as uh, Amy just said, they were really before their time. You all, the ones that are here, I, I've seen your names, you, you, were, you were special. Um, and, and they picked, the, the founders picked the perfect place to be. In fact, uh, I have a newspaper here, and I think we have it up here in 1965, when they had the 15th anniversary, the governor was here. And at that time, radiation was like the seventh largest industry in Florida, space industry in Florida. So there's lots of history that I've learned that was before my time. And I also learned that as a bean counter, a lot of what we did when I came, it was being done back then. So I, I understood uh, a lot of the mentality and the thinking that went into developing proposals and marketing pro projects. So Frank Perkins' legacy. Frank was known for the analog to digital converters. A lot of his paperwork talks about the Radicon, the Radiplex. You can tell he, was, he really did a lot of effort there. The PCM telemetry, the ground station, uh, please don't ask me to explain any of these. I'm just a bean counter, not an engineer. <laughs> but I've worked on these efforts. Um, PCM bit group synchronizer. There's a lot. This this takes care of Frank's legacy, and we want to preserve that. A lot of what Frank has in his pay is about the people, and what I learned. They were very resilient. They didn't take no for an answer. He has evidence. There are artifacts in there that speaks to the character and the type of engineers that you were. Uh, you were dedicated. There were numerous papers that you went all over the country presenting. They didn't just stop in Melbourne. You were all over the country uh, presenting your, your information. The work ethics was beyond reproach. Their passion for the work they perform, again, they work hard, you guys in here, you work hard, and you're very futuristic in your thinking. So it all pay, and, and so there, we owe so much to those early pioneers of radiation. A lot has been lost, but Frank has evidence of that existing by just looking at his work. Um, the people, the people. 
I mean, I really, because when I first came into this city, I used to see people working on Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And I, I would say to myself, I was never working on Friday night a Saturday night. Well, only about a year or two later, I was working on Friday night. <laughs> Saturday night. Sometime all night. And, uh, but you know, you look back and you can laugh at that. We have full 24 hours, right? Because the bean kind of still had to watch the uh, engineers make sure they didn't know the spin, right? Uh, <laughs> product, life cycle, that was another, uh, again, his collection contains uh, detailed marketing plans, how they didn't just say, oh, wow, we're going to do this. I mean, he has, he has papers that show where you had to go before. At that time, it was the board of directors um, and asked them for permission. You had to have uh, justifications. And all of that is contained in his paperwork. Another thing I want to say about the people and again, A.B. Uh, talked about it. The, the, uh, I found that these, you all came from all over the country. You know, like University of Cincinnati, University of Florida, Miami U, Oxford, Ohio, Union College, Georgia Institute of Technology. So some of the best minds in the country were bought here uh, to work at radiation. In terms of the product life cycle, um, Again, there's so much in there that shows the thought process. And we really, I have a great appreciation for that. Uh, this is one I found that, uh, this was dated 10 March, 1958. And it says for the future, and this was to the board of directors who at the time was, um, Homer Dennis was the president and George Shaw was the vice president of engineering. So everything went through him and I guess he took it on to the board at that time. So this, this shows you that for the future, we expect to design a complete line of universal components that they're calling black boxes. You've heard of the black boxes. It also goes on to say, uh, and this is where, again, Frank had a lot of work on the Rattleplex, the Rattapon, Rattamat, and those were like the two black boxes, but from what I can tell, we didn't go very far with those, but we did. They were used in some aircraft later on, but here we dare not leave it too far in the future because active competition is already on the move, and this is in 1958. So they were always looking ahead. PCM telemetry, we've already heard about that, the pulse code modulator. Uh, Frank, has, Frank Collection is uh, credited with logic design and again, we just talked about the Minuteman uh, Boeing contract. Customers, uh, he has lots of information on the various customers that Harris in the early days worked on or uh, worked with. And sometimes the customers weren't as nice in their feedback, uh, but we took that as po positive, uh, constructive criticism and move forward to make it better. Uh, so what's next now, and it's my time, I just got my little sign. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking as fast as I can. Uh, Frank's vision of radiation in the archives. And our goal now in working with Diane is to fulfill that. We're into year two. And again, I think we're closer than uh, we were a year ago. And we'll be able to tell the story of the men and women who put radiation on the map and make it possible for Ray, because you all, I say you all, because some of you in here were back with Frank during that era, but you made it possible for radiation to compete on the world's technology stage. And I'm sure this is why Harris in a tight <coughs> one of us. And so there you have the Frank Perkins legacy. <laughs> I'm just going to let him speak for himself because he is on, he says he retired a few years ago, but I'm going to tell you, neither of these guys retired okay. at all. Nobody did. Uh, they're still working hard. I'd like him to tell the story again. Well, I don't have any view graphs today, so maybe that will make my presentation a little bit more brief. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Uh, my voice doesn't vibrate. Uh, uh, 
resonators as well as my predecessors. Uh, about two or three years ago, uh, Frank and A.B. decided that they needed a wingman on the program. It was getting to be a pretty big project. And what they wanted to have was somebody that was old enough uh, that they had worked for the old Radiation Incorporated and young enough that they remembered the experience. <laughs> <laughs> and to the extent that those two requirements conflict with each other, you know, that kind of uh, thinned out the list of candidates quite a, quite a bit. Anyway, I got selected uh, for that and drafted onto the team at that time. Now, I had written a couple of things for the Radawiki, but I'd written and put them in there uh, for entertainment and not for posterity. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I was pretty skeptical about the whole process, to, to tell you the truth. In the first place, I wasn't sure we had a case uh, for exceptionalism. You know, I'd worked for Radiation and Harris all my life, so I didn't have anything to compare it to. But I couldn't imagine a researcher 10 or 15 years down the line being all that interested in the things that we had done back in the, in the 50s and 60s. And secondly, if we had such a case, I knew for darn sure that we hadn't made the case. Uh, if you looked at the archive that existed at that time, uh, it was pretty much like Clara described it. I, I use a different uh, simile. To me, it was like a great big box that had 400 jigsaw puzzles all disassembled and mixed together in this box, uh, a bunch of fragments. And I, and I just couldn't imagine somebody digging around in that box and concluding that we were, and from that that we were you know, swell bunch of guys. <laughs> so there I was. You know, they wanted a helper, but what they got was a troublemaker. <laughs> uh, but they were patient with me, and we talked about that a lot. And one of the things they convinced me of is that practically nobody gets to decide their own historical importance. To the about the best you can do is make an assumption that you did something worth remembering and rely on that forensic archaeologist 20 or 30 years down, down the line to look at it and decide whether you, that was uh, notable or not. So they convinced me that, that as a hypothesis, we ought to assume that we were an exceptional bunch of people that had done some exceptional things. And in the process, I recall a conversation I'd had about 50 years before that fellow by the name of George Doliana, who had come to radiation from the National Security Agencies, and we were talking one day, and George said, you know, coming to work for radiation is sort of like jumping into a washing machine on the spin cycle. <laughs> if you don't get a hold of something real quick, it's going to spin you right back out again. And I said, well, gee, we must be an awful bunch of snobs. <laughs> And George thought about that for a minute and said, no, that's not it. What it is is that nobody, including the janitor, is willing to slow down the train enough to let somebody get on. Now, he liked to mix his metaphors, but I got the message from all that, and I concluded, well, maybe there is something unusual about us. So I bought into the concept of the hypothesis, and the next step is, well, what are we going to do to make the case? We can't just hand this box full of puzzle pieces. And by the way, every one of those 400 puzzles had pieces missing. And there were more pieces missing every day because people were dying off that knew about them. <clears throat> so we decided we're going to have to dig into that box ourselves and put together at least some of the puzzles that paint a picture of who we were. And hopefully we can make that convincing enough that anybody that looks at those can be motivated to dig around in that box some more. Well, there's a lot in there. And uh, so that sounded like a pretty good proposition. And it marked the beginning of another episode in, in the development of the archive. So I'd go about that in two pieces. The first piece was the technology piece. 
you know, how did we go about from knowing so little you know, about radio telemetry in 1950 to an organization of 2,500 people that knew how to design and configure, buy and build and install and test a complex system like the Mark V or uh, like the Stonehouse system and so forth. So uh, that became a problem in mapping. We decided to create a thing that we subsequently called the technology tree to try to map out what did we learn, and when did we learn it, and why did we learn it, and how did that fit into the very next step of the process. So it was like a bubble chart, a great big one, by the way. And it started out with this one, two guys knowing a little bit about radio telemetry, and ending up in the late 60s with a very comprehensive, very state-of-the-art, changing the state-of-the-art, organization. So that was the first part. And it was very revealing to us, by the way, because one of the things we discovered was a lot of things that we had sort of assumed happened at random over that 17 year period of time were not random at all. That they fit together very nicely. You know, without learning this here, we couldn't have done that there. And without what we added to it, we couldn't have done this, and so on. Now that technology tree, uh, as you can imagine, is a great big thing. You lay it out on the floor and walk around on it if you want to. So it's a kind of a hard thing to install uh, in a searchable database, which Florida Tech is, is leading us to with the archive. So I'll come back to that in just a minute. The other part of the thing, though, had to do with the, with the work culture. Now, Clara had a slide that talked about the people and what was unusual about the people. And in all of our discussions, we kept hearing these phrases come up that sounded unusual. Uh, Can-do spirit. Willingness, not only willingness, but eagerness to take risk. Always being in a hurry and never quit because you got a problem. You know, those, those are things that if we can prove that, you know, maybe we can say something about radiation having been exceptional in some fashion. So what we decided to do in, in the case of describing the culture was to tell some stories, epic stories, by the way, uh, that would involve the, the heroic deeds of named people uh, on programs of high national priority they were large enough in scope that they would really characterize a part of the organization and not just look like a fluke. And uh, so we've selected three such epic programs. And uh, by the way, nobody said that yet today, but radiation was organized basically into three businesses. One was RF Communications, which was basically the analog part of the business, the big antennas. Uh, radar, communications, and so forth. The ground data part of the business, and by the way, Frank spent his entire career, I believe, in the ground data part, which was the forerunner of the digital imaging business that Paris is in today. And the third one uh, was originally called astronautics, but the third one was the aerospace part of the business. Those things having to do uh, with stuff off the ground that has to endure harsh environments and survive and so forth. So let's, let's see if we can identify an epic program between 1950 and 1967 from each of those three. And if we can bring out this can-do spirit, you know, the elements of the culture I was talking about, in each of those three stories, and we've made a pretty good case that that was the culture of the entire business, right? Uh, so we selected the Stonehouse Bay House program from the RF department and uh, wrote a story about that. Looked at it, it looked pretty good by the way it had all those elements built into it. He's bragging, he wrote the story. Yeah, I don't it all. <laughs> but anyway, that was, that was the first one and it gave us enough enthusiasm to carry on. 
The second one was a whole string of programs uh, called DMSP, the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, which is basically a story about creating and processing digital imaging from space, which led to <coughs> our hurricane tracking systems, our surveillance systems, and so forth. And for the Aerospace Division, we, we picked a program that, that radiation called the 1300 program. Uh, the rest of the world called it the Hexagon program. It was a surveillance satellite program that was designed to monitor Russia's compliance uh, with the nuclear arms limitation agreements. Very, very uh, difficult to do, very high priority, and in fact, I think the world depended on all three of those programs. That was, that was how uh, important they were. Uh, and along the way, we decided maybe we needed to add a fourth program. To that. And that was the Minuteman program. And the reason the Minuteman program was added as one of these epic stories was it laid the foundation for all the rest. As uh, A.B. mentioned, you know, that really uh, multiplied the business by a factor of five overnight and it created the credentials uh, to hire and expand and uh, win contracts that led to all these other things. So those are the four uh, epic stories that we set out to write. So that, that's currently created data now from all of those pieces. Uh, and uh, three of those four stories is, is complete. The DMSP one will be uh, complete before very long. And these are not, none of these stories are long enough to be a book. So what we decided to do was to put them all together into an anthology uh, and publish it as one, as one book. So that's what we hope to do when we get all of that written. And if any, any of you know a cheap publisher, let us know, because we're going we're to be in the market for one. And one final thing, and then I'll shut up. Uh, back to this technology roadmap. You know, that was a whole bunch of bubbles that said what the technologies were and how we learned to do system engineering and how we learned to run projects and how we uh, learned to develop customer relationships and so forth. But there wasn't very many words on that chart. So, and it wasn't hard to put in a database anyway. So a more a recent decision has been made to add a fifth story to the four I told you about to describe the evolution of the capabilities, technical and management and so forth, that also characterize the company. So hopefully uh, in, within the next six months, you know, we'll go into publication of that book. And it's been being put together exclusively for the archive. So it will become a part of it, I guess, and uh, you can uh, search it online. But I don't imagine they're going to sell very well. So you probably won't be able to find one at Amazon. <laughs> Okay, with that, I'll shut up, and we, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, questions from the audience? Thank you all. Let's give another round for... Uh, 
how will this be available? I mean, this, this thing I don't understand. I mean, they're, you're collecting all this, writing these stories. W when do we get the stories? <laughs> when and where and how? You have two customers for your book already. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, the lady, a lady that uh, our neighbor sent us up here. Um, you know, we, we weren't in the ground floor and all that, but I mean, some of the people. Uh, Worked for Harris or worked for radiation, and she, and her husband, and some of you know, just about everybody, their neighbors in uh, Sarna Heights and such, you know, uh, you know, worked at one time or another. I worked down in the plants years ago, and 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 um, you know, she sent us up to find out how she could find, you know, how could she get her hands on this. So uh, I'm a hands-on guy. So how do I uh, how do I get this? Okay, well. The bottom line would be that it would be available online right through the library website. But before we do that, I'm looking in to see whether we get a publisher. I see. And, and I like your idea to were you, were you talking about the book or are you talking about the whole archive? The book. Well, I'm talking about the book. The book, the book you're talking about. Condensed, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> most people are more interested in a, in a condensed version, not, not rooting through the archives. But, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But there's, a, there's another element. Uh, this morning I finished reading a book called The Innovators by Walter Isaacson. And the premise of that story, which is about all of the people going way back uh, who are involved in, in what has become the information age, the premise was that people who succeeded worked together. There were people who had an idea that would have succeeded had they had helpers, had they had a team. And so the whole premise of this amazing story is just exactly what we found with people with radiation. So I think that we may be able to look for a, a, a good publisher for this book, and that's a possibility. As it is now, um, it will be on our, our, if we don't do that, we will uh, put it on our website and you can read it. And you'll, yeah. you'll help me find that website. Absolutely. Yeah. I have, uh, yeah, I brought brochures. Anybody who's interested, brochures are up here. I brought some duplicates because I didn't bring them. But these are uh, items from our archives. And if you're interested, you can come up and look at some of those. Uh, and uh, um, my card, uh, I'm glad to give you my card if anybody wants it, but it's also on the brochure how to get in touch with me. And anybody who, who, who got an idea while they were here that they want to talk to us about, please don't hesitate to do that. We like the input. Diane, mm -hmm. Frank's book is also in the libraries and it's yes. available on Amazon.com right. if anybody wants it. That's right. And he's been pretty thorough every time we try it's to. pretty good. Yes, yeah. it is. A good start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, any other questions? The, the fact is, though, we don't, we don't really know anything about <laughs> publishing, and how the publisher may have something to say about how it gets distributed in, in the long run. Uh, but as a bare minimum, uh, you should be able to get it off of the Florida Tech Archive uh, website if you want it. And it may also be available in ARCO, right? I don't know that just yet. Uh, right now, uh, all of these write-ups, by the way, are on, about programs that at the time were heavily classified but have been since declassified. But we still have to get uh, pre-publication review and clearance uh, from the agency before we actually put it to, to ink and paper. And three of those four are already in for review now. So that's a part of the six months I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a question about uh, your reference to uh, the semiconductor business not paying off. <laughs> I worked for uh, Radiation Microelectronics when I got out of the Navy, which became Harris Semiconductor. And I remember one of the big things that we were doing at the time is we were sending the product overseas to be assembled. And when I was told at the time that the people who were sending them, you started reverse engineering them. And I was wondering if that was part of what caused that 
uh, that uh, business model to go belly up with the fact that we kind of that the company kind of gave you it away. Know, you're coming out of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, I don't. Our leaders were, were visionaries in several regards. They foresaw the huge and explosive demand for uh, very dense telemetry, uh, for satellite communications, and a whole bunch of other things. I don't think we had a clue as to where semiconductor and integrated, tech, uh, integrated circuit design was going. We had no idea of the commercial implications of that technology. And so I think we saw it primarily as just a smaller way to, to package an analog function of some sort. So I think we may have been doomed to failure from the beginning uh, because we were, uh, while we were working our way up to put things on four inch wafers, you know, the Japanese were on 10 inch wafers and you know, their economies of scale were just far beyond anything that we had ever considered. So that was that was one of the reasons. Uh, another reason, in my opinion, had to do with the way we went about expanding the uh, semiconductor business. You may recall that uh, Harris acquired GE Solid State and made it a part of our semiconductor operation. And GE Solid State, just a couple of years before that, had acquired RCA Semiconductor. And so what we bought was a conglomeration of two entirely different and incompatible cultures that had not been integrated even internally, uh, and brought it into a third culture, which is more like the one that we described here, and in which neither of the two others fit. So we were never able to digest successfully uh, the merger of those companies. Now, fortunately, you know, fortunately for us, both GE and RCA owned a whole bunch of patents that had been infringed upon by lots and lots of other com uh, commercial companies. And so our legal staff made more money in the semiconductor business for the original premise for getting into the uh, physical electronics business or integrated circuits, we thought that an electronic company had to have in-house capability to do that. We did not realize that it would become commodity items that you could just purchase from Intel and stuff like that. So the, the basic idea was wrong to begin with, and so we didn't need that. I, I wanted to say something. Uh, uh, okay, I'll answer it. But uh, today we talked about stuff that we've got in the archive. We've got documents, we've got photographs, stuff like that. We've got some <coughs> personal memory uh, stuff. I've done, I've done some. Uh, one thing that we don't have as much of uh, in the archive as we ought to have is the, per is the community impact that radiation has. I talked about, you know, radiation lives, and I talked about helping get the hospital going and the integrated communities and stuff. There's a lot more story there, and uh, there's a lot more backup for, for what I said. It needs to be in the archive. And uh, I, I'm hoping that it's, uh, you guys, some of you will do that. I talked with Dory uh, earlier. Uh, George John's daughter, Jerry Dixon, had a bunch of stuff under her bed. <laughs> uh, and she was going to get some out. Uh, and, uh, and maybe I'll tell you that George had dictated some stuff on tape and he was going to transcribe it. And uh, I asked Dory if she would volunteer to help you transcribe that stuff and see if that would make that happen a little bit quicker or something. So, uh, yeah, but, but there's um, more stuff that uh, needs to be in the archive about the com community impact of, of radiation because it, it made this town, it made this south of our county, uh, change it from uh, 3,500 mullet fishermen and groves and grove growers with a backward bank and uh, 
end of the place we got now. Now, I'm not sure that that's so good. <laughs> 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 the traffic is bad, the river is polluted, and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we have a lot to do with that, good or bad. You moved to Grand. <laughs> yeah, I moved to Grand. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add one more reason why the, uh, the microelectronics division had commercial fuel cars. And that is that they were using a brand new <coughs> or a very innovative means of dielectric isolation. They weren't the details, but it was perfect for space use where the integrated surface might be damaged by space radiation. But it was much more difficult and more yield for commercial applications. So that there was never going to be a good commercial result from that basic technology. And but I think that, that's the major reason. It was very important for a lot of programs of what it really was. was. And it had a, uh, a very niche market, mm -hmm. but you don't make a lot of money that way. <laughs> Technically, very, very advanced. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming. We are out. Thank you. Thank you guys. We do not have a November meeting.